Of all the Primarchs, I would say that Lehman Russ is the one that I could tell you the story for many times over without really missing a detail. Or, well, at least the old lore. Things have really progressed a lot for Lehman Russ and, and, the, and the Space Wolves and the Wolf King himself um, in the most recent lore of the Horus Heresy. And the Wolf King, master of the Space Wolf Legion, has this history that is less tragic than his brothers, but far more boisterous and loud, you know, much like the Great Wolf himself. And we've covered a great deal of Trader Primarchs, so where we see their flaws become the driving force behind the wedge that pries them from the Greater Imperium. But Lehman Russ stands above the struggle of his brothers to become the Primarch with an unerring dedication to the Emperor, even in light of some of the situations that happen in the later portion of the Horus Heresy that really cause Lehman Russ to question his own motives and where he kind of stands in the Imperium. And there are a lot of times in the lore, before and after the heresy, where the Space Wolves will uphold what is right, quote-unquote, even in the face of an inquisitorial sanction. Uh, more on that later. But let's get into the world of Fenris, of the Volka, or I guess the Wolka of Fenrika, the Wolves of Fenris, and the Lehman Russ. So our story begins, like most Primarchs, on a death world, in a far-flung portion of the galaxy, far away from the Emperor's light on distant Terra. Deep in the Segmentum Obscura, which is very close to what eventually becomes the Eye of Terror, Fenris is unlike the other worlds we've talked about so far. Fenris is almost entirely covered in snow, with small, tempered islands dotted throughout the vast oceans of the planet, uh, massive thunder wolves, black-maned wolves, uh, Fenrisian wolves stock the landscape along with ice bears, mastodons, and other abnormally sized woodland creatures. Um, it's actually kind of talked about that Fenris itself is shaped like a wolf's head, and everything on Fenris itself has a lot of wolf characteristics. Even the Krakens we're about to talk about, you know, the Krakens in addition, and monstrous leviathans move unnoticed through the depths of Fenris until they are upon any hapless members of the native population. The planet's tectonic plates kind of shift every two or three times per year, creating an entirely different landscape. So this makes mapping Fenris itself near impossible, save for the northern polar continent which remains mainly intact you know that's kind of where things get built up and, and main st and stay the most because things don't shift as much up there so this is the hell in which lehman russ crash lands on smack dab in the middle of her thunder wolf mother's den there he was raised by the she-wolf who i mean obviously sensed the feral energy of the nascent primarch so um it's it's worth noting that a thunder wolf is a version of a it's a it, the apex predator version of a Ven Fenrisian wolf. It's the most, uh, the largest, like like a timber wolf. Think of it like a timber wolf in our timeline there, which are now extinct, but Thunder Wolf is the biggest, baddest, most uh, terrifying and ferocious of them all. But we see this happen a lot in the story of the Primarchs, where their stories parallel certain origin or mythological stories in our own times. Uh, Lehman Russ's early childhood is very similar to Romulan and Remus, raised by a uh, I'm sorry, Romulus and Remus. <laughs> Romulan, <laughs> that's a Star Trek reference. But they're raised by a massive she-wolf. And this is true for a number of prolific figures in their own respective mythos of being raised by wolves. I mean, it's still sort of insult to people regarding their feral behavior. But of course, for Lehman Russ, that's quite the uh, compliment. So eventually, Lehman Russ's wolf family was discovered by a group of kind of hunting party natives, I guess you yeah, a hunting party of natives, who attacked the pack on sight, killing the wolf mother and the majority of the wolf pack save two. Now Russ went into a rampage, slaughtering over a dozen warriors with his bare hands. And this was the moment when the natives discovered that Lehman Russ, or Russ, was actually a man and stopped attacking. The last two wolves, Freki and Gary, uh, joined Russ and the natives in returning to King Thangir of the Russ tribe's camp. Gary's kind of a very unassuming and really not a cool name for a wolf, but I'm going to go with it. It's actually pr probably pronounced like Jerry or something like that. I have no idea. But this story goes as it does for most of our Primarchs, right? Russ quickly devoured all knowledge presented to him, learning to eloquently speak low Gothic, but the vernacular of Fenris, uh, becoming a masterful warrior, hunter, and tribesman. Thangir knew that the boy was destined for greatness and, and really granted him a true name, Lehman of the Russ, hence where we get Lehman Russ from. And Russ went on to claim victory in a number of prominent duels against the champion of the King's Guard and became a leader amongst the Russ tribe itself, all the while with his two wolfkin in tow. Now, when King Thangir eventually died of old age, much to the thanks of uh, Russ's thousands of victories against the other tribes, the mantle of leadership 
passed on to the Primarch. Thus is the legacy of the Wolf King of Fenris born. And the early reign of Russ is really filled with a ton of hyperbole, as befits the legion who closely falls in line with Nordic backgrounds. In addition, they have a long-running tradition of uh, word of mouth as a way to keep track of their history, or, or oral history as we all know, versus uh, written history, or oral sex, which we all know. Wait, what? So, we have these sweeping tales of Russ, you know, toppling mastodons with a mere hip check, uh, defeating entire armies without a scratch single-handedly, uh, tear whole trees out from the ground, you know, all these kind of big, huge, sweeping stories, all manner of stories that actually really might not be entirely crazy. I mean, Russ was basically hopped up on cosmic genetic Russian steroids, and you can't spell Russian without Russ. So I'm not sure how crazy these stories are. Also, he's the embodiment of Norse badassery in Warhammer. I mean, so, so take that as you will, with a fist of fucking thunder. Now, anyway, anyway, Russ becomes the wolf king of the entire planet, ruling over all tribes of men. And the Emperor undoubtedly hears about this man who has taken over a planet and rightfully assumes it's one of his wayward sons. Now here's something I have never truly appreciated about the lore of these legions, or, or even really understood. A lot of the Primarchs are, you know, sent to far-flung planets that are now feudal or tribal or outright primal and that there is no connection to the greater Imperium or really any sort of interstellar communication or travel whatsoever. So how does the Emperor quote-unquote, hear of this. I mean, you could make the argument that it, it is all down to psychic connection with his sons, but it's something I've I've always really wondered about because the Index of Stardust definitely makes it sound like it's rumors that spread. Like, oh, did you hear hearsay about the wolf man going and con conquering Fenris and Emperor going, hey man, the fuck's Fenris? I don't know where that is. But uh, the only other Primarch who actually reaches out directly to to the Emperor himself is Magnus. It, we've, we've talked about that before, how Magnus and the Emperor had a rapport before even they actually met in person. So I always kind of wondered how they were drawn to each other. In some origin stories, it talks about how the Emperor is actually physically and psychically drawn towards his sons. And other times, they kind of make it out to be like, he got like, honestly, he got like a Twitter update that's like, hashtag Wolf King. And he's like, I'm going to go investigate. So back on track, back on track. So. Russ enjoys this pretty great time ruling over now the majority of Fenris, and there's a few errant clans here and there, but nothing really overwhelming. The Emperor makes way for Fenris and really kind of disguises himself as a cloaked traveler, wandering from town to town, and he knew he had to destroy the soul stone of Diablo... Wait, whoa, sorry. <laughs> wrong lore, wrong lore. Don't you guys have phones? Anyway. The Emperor goes to the Wolf King's Great Hall and challenges Russ to his face, in front of all of his retainers at the mighty Wolf Throne. And if the stranger won, he would be given the privilege of drinking at the right hand of Russ during the feast. If Russ won, then the Emperor would serve him for an entire year. Now, agreeing, the two went to their grand challenge, which was in three parts, kind of broken up as it were. Their first challenge was an eating contest, because, you know, after all, they're at a massive the feast, and the Emperor went down, I'm sorry, went to town and ran a train on some Venerisian chicken wings, eating more than most men at the banquet. And as he went to reach for more food, he discovered that Russ had eaten everything, eaten the whole entire hall out of its food stuff. So Russ won Emperor Zero. The second challenge was a drinking contest. The Emperor summoned up his frat days and did a cosmic beer bong the likes that had not been seen, chugging through six whole barrels of Venerisian mead. And reaching for his seventh, he again discovered that Russ had finished the entire feast's alcohol reserve, so Russ too, Emperor, a big fat zero. So this incensed the Emperor, and, and to be honest, it should have made way more people mad. And what makes what, what, what seems like the span of an hour, two dudes ate the entire food and alcohol stuffs, or what was what, what was supposed to be a grand party. So, you know, some celebration this was, Lehman, real real dude. Either way. The Wanderer forsakes Russ's attitude, you know, kind of calling him a number of pointed curses such as drunkard, uh, low credit score lout, and uh, glutton, and essentially challenging his, challenging his legacy as someone with the inability to actually accomplish really fucking anything. You, you're just sitting, you're just here to drink and eat. You don't really do anything, Lehman Russ. So he kind of goads the Wolf King, and Russ spoke over the, the hush court that the third challenge was to be a duel. Now, in the quote-unquote old lore, that was that was all that happened. The Emperor challenged Russ, and they fought, and that was it. 
In the updated lore, this sort of Norse-style story is crafted between these two, as is told in many songs of our own history, right? We get these grand sweeping tales about Beowulf and how he accomplished things in, in many, many, many stages and feats, or, Hercu or Hercules, and or even Superman, but whatever. Um, my point is that it, they expand and, and, and flesh out this lore to be a little bit more wide-sweeping. But the Emperor throws back his cloak, revealing himself as the actual Emperor, no longer just this Wanderer. And he's covered in golden power armor and wielding a massive power glove. And the duel was over almost before it started. I mean, he used the colossal gauntlet to break Russ. And after Lehman came to, he declared his fealty to the Emperor of Mankind. And thus, the Space Wolves were born. So joining up with the uh, Sixth Legion, renamed thusly the Space Wolves, as we've mentioned, Lehman Russ stayed under the tutelage of the Emperor for a number of weeks. And the Sixth Legion had been implanted with the Canis Helix, the gene seed of the Space Wolves, bearing the traits and values that Lehman Russ exhibited. So you're going to have a whole entire, I almost said race, chapter or legion of, of wolfmen, basically, with long hair, varying shades of color, red, brown, white, gray, blonde. Um, everyone's got these very long fangs, and as they get older, the, the fangs still grow in size. That's what they call the older older uh, marines of the Space Wolves chapter, the long fangs, because they are the, the most senior, aside from, of course, the wolf guard and the wolf lords themselves. So, um, and in addition to that, every single one of the Space Wolves has enhanced hearing, enhanced smell. Uh, in a lot of the books, they talk about how they can smell the enemy coming or they can smell certain uh, situations that are about to unfold, like the tension between uh, two opposing parties. And it kind of makes the Space Wolves like a step above. Whenever you read the lore, you're like, Jesus Christ, these guys are kind of like badasses in the sense that they can smell things coming around the corner if it's not downwind. They can hear things acutely well. And their their howl, like the, the Lehman Russ's howls is suspected to be kind of like a psychic scream a little bit. Um, but these, they're, they're a little bit of a cut above normal space marines, to be totally honest. And uh, they have like a predatory sense too. So they're very much, well, I mean, as you would expect, Connie's Helix, they're very wolf-like. In addition to that, they have a, a, a curse, Curse of the Wolfen, just like we see with the Blood Angels who have the Red Thirst. The Curse of the Wolfen turns them into essentially werewolves. And this is kind of rooted out in the early processes of becoming a Space Wolf when you're in a neophyte cadet type stages. It gets rid of that. Doesn't, I'm sorry, doesn't get rid of the curse. It roots out who has been affixed by the cursed. And then basically uh, we, they root them out from the chapter itself. So we've talked about a number of issues that most Primarchs face during this time of, you know, coming into the fold. Either the Primarch railing against the pre-established structure or, or outright changing everything. And this might be fleshed out more as more books about Rust during the Horus Heresy come to light. But Lehman has, has really little trouble acclimating to his legion as they do him. I mean, furthermore, he's granted leave to work on his own for the Great Crusade in only a matter of weeks, which versus most Primarchs spending more time under the Emperor. I mean, the early reforging the legion was in part due to the success of Russ's veterans. And Russ himself is the second um, Primarch to be found alongside Ferris Manus. I mean, you have the Horus come first, and then Russ and Ferris Manus essentially happen around the same time. I wanna, I'm just going to throw a word out there and say it's around the same year, but they come into the fold around the same time. But not all the Primarchs, but a good portion of them took a, a select few into the new legion with them, you know, typically kind of giving them a name as befitting the legacy of their adopted homeworld. Like the Night Lords have the Atramentar. Those are their, that's their their big like elite unit that has kind of derived something from their homeworld. The Fire Drakes for the Salamander is named after the, the gigantic Fire Drakes of the Salamander homeworld. But the Space Wolves had the Varagir Wolf Guard or the Varangi. And the, not to be confused with the Frangi, that this is not a second Star Trek reference, but these are the, the oath sworn men of, Fer, of Fenris that followed Russ into space, you know, taking the, in the Connie's Helix despite their age. And just surprisingly, a large number of them actually made it all the way to full blown Astartes, which is quite rare for anyone not indu inducted in their kind of teens or early 20s. And this sort of speaks to the ferocious resilience of the Space Wolves that permeates the Legion. I mean, Russ then. Uh, disseminated these guys across the entire Legion, helping to lead and guide the Sixth Legion. This didn't really go over well initially. You know, the Sixth Legion was as prideful as their liege lord was, so you can imagine how they hate being told what to do. And a lot of these initial uh, Vergir Guard actually form up what's called the 13th Company, and the, the 13th Great Company. 
and we're going to go into them a little bit more later in this video, but we're going to give them their own video. They, they definitely do deserve their own video. So the these Varangi, Varangii, they basically kind of make up a lot of the leaders and a lot of the other personnel that are important to each and every chapter or, or great company is what they're actually called in the, uh, the Space Wolf Legion, and they help kind of lead from the front. Now, the fledgling Legion took to their stars on their first campaign, the Wheel of Fire. And you have to remember, at this time, there are only three total Primarchs that, we, that we've discussed, right? We've been discovered uh, Horus, Ferris, Minos, and Lehman Russ, like we just mentioned a little bit ago. So there's not a lot of supporting Primarchs or overlapping campaigns like we see towards the end of the Great Crusade. The entire Sixth Legion heads for the Wheel of Fire, a subsector of the eastern portion of the galaxy. And there, the Space Wolves clash headlong with the massive Orc Empire of Cheridon. Greenskins in the billions fight against the Wolf Brothers of Rus. And this is really a massive campaign, and, and really it's extremely pivotal. You have the Legionnaires of the Sixth who are untested in, Rolf, in Rus's eyes, um, all of them being born mainly from Terra, and being led by the Varagir Guard who are tested but don't know the technology at the time. The ultimate result is a divided legion that teaches its strengths to the other portion, coming out as a stronger and fiercer legion for it. And although the campaign sees a third of the total Space Wolf Legion being destroyed, it's ultimately deemed a success. This also sets the pace for why the Space Wolves are one of the smaller legions. That and always throwing themselves on the far and end of the frontier at any chance they get. But the Emperor gifts Rus with the Spear of Rus, and the Fang is built on Fenris to commemorate the momentous occasion. The Emperor cuts red tape with gigantic golden power scissors. It's a great goddamn time. There's champagne. It's awesome. The Mechanicus is wild. They're taking their robes off. But moving on, there's two events that, we're, that we've uh, talked about already, but they're worth bringing up. The Night of the Wolf, where Angron and Russ fight, and this is over the Butcher's Nails that Lehman Russ is told has is told Angron to stop using. It's a sanction from the Emperor himself. And this results in a pretty big stain upon both Legion's honor and pride. This is where Russ breaks his famed chainsword, Krakenmaw, and is granted Mjolnar, the uh, massive two-handed frost sword. Uh, I guess, w worth mentioning, in total, Russ has like four weapons. Yolnar, his frost sword, the spear of Russ, the axe of Hellwinter, which is a frost, a frost axe crafted from a, from Kraken teeth, and then lastly, Scorn Spitter, a bolt pistol modified and crafted by Vulcan himself. So he's not really hurting for weapons here. And we see him like swapping these interchangeably throughout the Horus Heresy and everything. But then there's the other in, uh, incident where Lionel Johnson punches Lehman Russ over a perceived slight when they were bringing a world back into Imperial Compliance. This spawns the great feud between the Dark Angels and the Space Wolves, where they have a champion of each one's respective chapter fight once a year in the current era. Now, there's a bit of a retcon nowadays. Uh, it, during that initial fight, it said that, Le that Lionel Johnson punched Lehman Russ so hard that it, it, knocked, it killed one of his hearts. It destroyed one of his hearts. In Wolf's Bane, we see that that's a different, um, a different result. So for those of you that have read Wolfsbane, I'm just going to tip my fedora to that. But um, both of those stories are covered in depth in their respective Primarchs video. So I'll let you dive into those. But there's another thing I want to get into and by a respective video. I mean, the Angren video covers the Night of the Wolf. The Lionel Johnson video covers what happens between Lionel Johnson and Lehman Russ. So you can jump onto those videos to kind of hear a little bit more about them. But I want to get into something that plays heavily into the Night of the Wolf. And... Sometime between Lehman's rediscovery and the Horus Heresy, uh, the, that handful of hundreds of years, Russ earns the title the Emperor's Executioner. And we know of 20 total Primarchs that came from the Emperor's Primarch experiment and out into the void. And two of those are shrouded in absolute mystery. And it's really not until recently that we're starting to hear more and more about them. In the earlier days, the two were wiped from the Imperial records, suspected to have been um, corrupted upon contact or lost to the warp, and, and that, that was it. You had entries on the, in the rulebook that just said it, and you moved on from there. But it's supposed to kind of create this illusion that, okay, there's these two legions that don't exist, but you, the hobbyist, can create whatever chapters or, or legions or origin stories you want to create, and you can use uh, the, the 19th and the 2nd Legion as your kind of uh, starting off point, if you so wish. So that was the original intention. In the current Horus Heresy series, we know that the two legions were actually officially sanctioned and eventually killed, and they're referred to 
uh, as the Forgotten and the Purged, which I'm not, on, I'm honestly not sure if that means one is forgotten in a, a literal sense of saying like, not saying like, oh, I forgot my fucking car keys. I mean like they're forgotten as in, hey, these guys are intentionally forgotten. Let's not bring them up ever again. And one was purged or the title of both of them. So I'm not sure if it's supposed to imply that the purge was killed. The forgotten was found and decided, oh, this is too corrupt. We have to kill it off. Or the title for both of them is forgotten and purged. So there aren't a ton of details on this and it's worth expanding upon on its own video. So we can, we, uh, we know a scant number of facts that derived some semblance of truth around this mystery, but if you want to hear more, do let me know. I can, I can do a whole new video on that. It's, there's, it's starting to develop more and more as these, as these books come out. So it's a pretty hot button topic right now. It's constantly changing, but Russ himself admits that he's familiar with fighting other space Marines and Dorn remarks that he's afraid of another empty Primarch statue in the Emperor's palace. Even Sanguinius is afraid to talk about the red thirst for fear of it kind of, uh, being the, or, or the blood angels themselves being the third legion to be purged. And a lot of people then sort of band a words at Rusk asking if he'll be sent to censure them and, and the such like almost like a threat, like, Oh, what are you going to do? Russ? Are you going to be, are you going to come over here and kill us? Is basically the kind of attitude that they give him. And a lot of the ways uh, they, they kind of start to mention these forgotten legions in the books and they're quickly, Hey, no, we're not supposed to talk about that. We're under oath not to talk about that. So I'm assuming that as we get to the last book or the last handful of books, Horus and the Emperor will have a conversation that sheds light on what those two legions were about. But until then, we have not much to go on. So there's a lot of speculation about the two lost legions. And again, if you'd like to, I can go into more detail in another video. Just let me know in the comments below, as always, guys. But as a whole, the Space Wolves were a very successful legion. You know, they pushed out to the deep fringes of the galaxy to spread the Emperor's light like a, you know, like a smooth sheen of butter on finely toasted bread. <laughs> but when the Horus heresy finally broke out, Lehman Russ was truly out too far to be really much of much aid. And, and that was Horace's plan, really. Attack when the legions were furthest from each other and information could not be reliably transmitted. Just mass confusion. We see this with the Dark Angels. We see we, he pulls the Ultramarines back into the Ultima Segmentum to kind of fragment them apart as well. And this is his grand stroke. And this doesn't mean that the Space Wolves were absent from the events from the Heresy, far from it. One of the biggest and earliest moves in the Heresy, even before the drop site massacre, is the grand burning of Prospero. And we know the tale of how Magnus the Red, the Primarch of the Thousand Suns, reached through the veil to contact his emperor. And in doing so, he broke the wards on the webway and of Terra, Holy Terra itself. This allowed demons to kind of pour forth and in and out of the webway into the actual throne room of uh, Terra. This royally pisses off the Emperor, and not only did Magnus jeopardize the Emperor's plan of breaching the Black Library, but he also broke the creed set out by the Council of Nikea, uh, Nikea or whatever, but Nikea, which uh, banned the use of sorcery and psychers in the Imperium as a whole. Now, having no choice, he sent Lehman Rust to Prospero to bring Magnus back to Terra to kind of answer for his transgressions. And Lehman Rust wasn't really a huge fan of Magnus to begin with, as the Space Wolves stood staunchly, as I would say, against the Thousand Sons during the Council of Nikea, advocating against the use of sorcery itself, with a, with amongst the like Mortarian and the such, who was saying, hey, we can't have sorcery in our legions, it's gonna, it's gonna, uh, <laughs> it's gonna rot our brains, those damn kids and their Grand Theft Auto. But, in fact, Russ went so far as to say psychic warfare and the means by which the Thousand, Zone, Thousand Sons conduct warfare is overly dishonorable, and, and the combat should be met, and that combat itself should be met with blade and fang, and not sleight of hand and tricks. And this, of course, you know, overly ironic because the rune priests and the wolf priests of everything are basically all soothsayers and shamans. In fact, the entire culture of the Space Wolves is heavily tied to its shamanistic and ritualistic beliefs. So, I guess that's neither here nor there, I suppose. But it's always kind of a weird dichotomy that uh, the Space Wolves don't want anything to do with, you know, the Veerd, as they call it, W-Y-R-D, or the warp science, or not science, warp uh, sorcery, or anything of the sort, yet their rune priests command, like, the, the, the abilities of lightning, in the very much in the same way that the white scars have the commands of, like, the elements. So it's, it's a very weird, like, shamanistic thing that is quite clearly uh, warp sorcery that they're like, no, 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 that's just the Veerd, we're, we're good, we got, we got this. But... Yeah, and back on track here. In route to Prospero, Horus 
intercepted Russ and told him of many more atrocities that Magnus had undergone, and essentially kind of essentially kind of striking a bigger flame of fury in the Wolf King, enraging him. And Horus's parting message to Russ is that the Emperor amended his previous order, and that the new one was to launch a full-scale planetary assault on Magnus and the Thousand Suns, purging another Primarch. The incensed wolf was only too happy to oblige as they entered the system of the Thousand Suns. And a combined force of the entire Space Wolves Legion, which I think was, uh, I had read somewhere, it's like the Thousand Suns had numbered somewhere from like 60 or 80, 60 or 70,000 Marines. And the Space Wolves had been, had been a little bit larger. I think it was like either 90 or to 110. I can't remember the actual numbers. And those numbers are very, very like in flux. So again, don't, don't quote me on any of that because that's, it just depends on which book you're reading because the older books say, oh, there was 4,000. So that's my point. Either way, entire Space Wolf Legion, Imperial Guard Attachment, and the Sisters of Silence fell upon the world of Prospero. And for all their guile and wisdom and psychic abilities and forethought, the Thousand Suns could not resist the unquenched fury of the Space Wolves as they threw themselves upon the planet's defenses, breaking through ward after ward. And it said that the 13th Great Company was the one that actually led the charge here. They're using their, their wolf and their curse of the wolf in to really break through a lot of the initial wards that the Thousand Suns had set up, using that kind of bestial ferocity to kind of push the line ever onward, ever onward, right over up until, you know, Magnus's door. And after endless orbital bombardments and ground attacks, the Space Wolves fought bitterly with brothers about the ruins of the cities until Primarch met Primarch. Magnus used his psychic abilities to bolster his strength during his duel with Russ, which made the Wolf King only angrier. Hefting the red giant above his head, Russ, Russ brought Magnus down on his knee in a WWE pro wrestling break backbreaker move. And as Magnus tumbled from the Lord of Wolves' leg, Russ undoubtedly let out a large woo and a cheesy wolf wrestling slogan like, Good luck chasing your tail, Magnus. Fuck, that was bad. Okay, I'm moving on from that one too. Jesus. So after the back break, Magnus makes his deal with Zinch, stealing himself and the rest of his legion away. And there's going to be a digression here. At one point, the lore says that the, the 13th Great Company pursued the, the um, Thousand Sons into the warp, following them to kind of wreak havoc on them. Um, I'm going to go with a later theory that, that comes in a little bit, but I just want to, I want to put that as a little, uh, a little footnote there. So... This is not the only engagement the Space Wolves are involved in. After Prospero, the Legion goes to muster in, Alexis, in, in the Alexis Nebula, regathering and licking their wounds. And, and no pun intended there, shit. But you have this completely battered Legion that has suffered massive losses in the name of another quote-unquote victory that is then beset upon another enemy. The Alpha Legion has had been launched by Horus to really clean up the victor of the burning of Prospero. Uh, the burning of Prospero was meant to push Magnus into becoming a disciple of chaos. And we actually, we actually see by the White Scars book and stuff like that, that Magnus is not so much like, a, oh, okay, well, I'm pissed now. Now, I, now I'm full all for chaos. He actually spends a great deal of time on the planet of sorcerers, which is where he eventually ends, kind of saying to himself, like, what the hell do I do now? I don't, I don't trust Magnus. I don't trust Horus. Um, the Emperor has forsaken me. I'm still ultimately loyal to the to the Imperial way, and, but I've just been kind of cast aside. So it's a very interesting scenario. I mean, the Thousand Suns, for the most part, sit out the remainder of the Horus Heresy. But this uh, massive fleet fell upon the Space Wolves, engaging them as they poured out of the warp one at a time. And a Jagatai Khan of the White Scars had gone to Prospero to see what had happened with his own eyes. So he was in the system as well. And uh, this is a, a pretty kind of scary point for Jagatai because he doesn't know who's a traitor and who's an enemy. So the Space Wolves called for aid, but the White Scars were still really unsure, right, uh, of who was actually a loyalist and who was a traitor. So he took leave of the scenario, wishing luck, uh, wishing Russ best of luck. Which, I mean, this is just very unbrotherly and kind of dickish if you think about it. But alone, the Space Wolves had to fend off these this massive fleet of the Alpha Legion. Despondent, trapped, and feeling abandoned, Russ left the right left left the fight in the hands of his first captain, Gunner Gunhilt, leaving for his personal chambers to isolate himself. The engagement was brutal, reaping a massive tally on the Space Wolves. Russ was 
really f was finally roused from his me melancholic stupor by Bjorn One-Handed, soon to be the fell handed that we all know today, who helped him come to terms with his executioner title. I mean, Russ kind of really, this is the tragedy of Russ, I guess you could say. He has this unflinching loyalty to the emperor, to his father. And his dad puts a pretty, or the emperor puts a pretty heavy burden on his shoulders. Go kill your brother. Go kill your brother again. Hey, go kill your brother a third time. And it's clearly weighing on him. I mean, he's he's basically lost the, he won the battle, lost the war for Prospero itself. He ended up killing, well, banishing or, or his brother forsaken into the nether. <laughs> Just disappears. But he kind of, he bemoans his, his position as this kind of mindless weapon of the emperor versus someone who can sit there and say, Dad, no. <laughs> Dad, no, I'm not going to do I'm going to play my own music in the garage. No, he kind of tells, he kind of uh, reasons with himself, like, I should be the one questioning the emperor's motives when he wants me to purge an entire legion here. So not necessarily question him in a way that is, I don't trust you emperor, but in a way of like, I have to give the emperor counsel. I can't just say yes blindly, basically is what I'm trying to say here. So he kind of comes to grips with this and decides, okay, I'm never going to be a blind weapon ever again. And this kind of enables him to, to rouse up and kind of rally here. And this caused a, a shockwave across the entire Space Wolf fleet. It, it, it created this huge rallying cry as Russ kind of returns to the bridge of the, of the uh, Hrofenkel, the flagship of the fleet. And as the battle raged on, a unit of Lernian, Lair, Lair, Lairnian, I could, I could have edited that out, but I promise it would have been just as bad every time I did it. Lernian Terminators from the Alpha Legion teleported aboard the flag, flagship and made contact with Russ. So he's kind of stuck in this bitter end time, not end times, bitter melee with um, the elite of the Alpha Legion's Cataphracti Terminators. In the last moments, kind of before victory seemed certain for the Alpha Legion, the wolves were saved by a very unlikely ally. The Dark Angel Starfort, the Chimera, leading a large Legion fleet, turned the tides for the wolves. And winning the day, the Chapter Master Althalos and Lehman Russ convened on the Starfort to talk about the current situation. So, the Dark Angels had been sent out by Luther 60 some odd years before the heresy to conquer more systems. And this is the first time Russ is hearing both of Luther's corruption and the heresy as a whole. You know, the Dropsite Massacre is now fully in effect. And he knows now that Horace is a, is a complete and utter tra traitor. So both individuals are at a very interesting intersection. Because Althalos, who is uh, essentially not, not um, uh, beholden or loyal to Luther, now has to go back and find out what the hell is going on. So he has to bring his entire massive fleet back to uh, Caliban to discover what's going on. So Alphalos decides to head to Caliban with his fleet and try and find the Legion. But this is where we get a lot of those really weird discrepancies here. In the old lore, the Fenris is still just too far out from, from Terra to really do anything. And he's just kind of, he's that, that's the footnote of the end of the Horus Heresy. Like, okay, the Horus Heresy ends. Too bad, so sad. Space Wolves couldn't make it. In the new Horus Heresy books, uh, Lehman Russ returns to Terra with all of his, um, uh, what's it called? All, all of his legion. And he kind of waits. He's trying to find out how to strike back at Horus. He needs to do something about Horus. And there is a book that talks about the in, it's, uh, the, the kind of invasion into the vengeful spirit, the, the flagship of Horus himself to find out the weaknesses and everything like that. And you get Garviel Loken, who's going through the whole thing. Garviel's from the, the first three books of the uh, Horus Heresy series. And he kind of maps it out to give to Russ to infiltrate. And in the most recent lore, we know that Russ and Horus have a huge clash in the book Wolfsbane. And since it's relatively newly released, I think it's like uh, we're on book 50 and it's book 48 or 49, or, or it might have to be 47. But since it's newly released, I don't want to go into spoilers of the book. Uh, it's needless to say, though, that Russ clearly doesn't win the engagement. But he loses a huge amount of Space Wolf in the process before trying to make his way back to Terra. And he unfortunately did not make it in time. And Horus knew if he had, uh, if, if Russ had made it back, the fight would have been very different. But the heresy comes to the close with the death of Sanguinius at the hands of Horus. And the slaying, soul and all, of Horus by the Emperor, who also suffers a grievous wound that enters him upon the Golden Throne in, perpet in perpetuity. 
So the Horus Heresy had come to a close and the galaxy was, was really in ruins. And after the Heresy, Robot Guillemin of the Ultramarines set out the Codex Astartes. The goal here was to prevent any an, another heresy from happening by limiting the amount of space marines that any one man could wield. And the legions were broken into chapters with 10 companies in each. So uh, to kind of put this into perspective for you, the legions would, which would have numbered in the hundreds of thousands strong were reduced down to 1,000 strong chapters. Uh, the Dark Angels actually used chapters already. Uh, the Space Wolves called their chapters great companies. So it's already a kind of pre-established way of doing things. But the Legion is fracturing into brand new chapters with different names. Heraldry, but staying true to the teachings of their parent Legion and Primarch. This was called the Second Founding. You know, the Ultramarines broke into a ton of other chapters, with the Ultramarines being their kind of home uh, origin chapter, I guess you could call it. Call it. But the Second Founding almost resulted in another civil war immediately after the last one had started. I mean, a lot of the Primarchs weren't interested in, in you know, dividing their space marine pizza into any more slices than they already were. And this was especially true for Lehman Russ and the Space Wolves. You can look at people like the Iron Hands or Corvus Corax of the Raven Guard. They were fine with it. Same thing with the Salamanders. They they still didn't, they still had like about under a thousand uh, men anyway. So like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll take your chapter thing and do it. Uh, oh, there's not enough of us to make more chapters? <laughs> Who would have thought? Like, it, it is more beneficial to the, to the ones that suffered the most casualties or the ones that really saw the way of things. So, definitely, of course, Guillemin and Dorne were on the, on the forefront of that. Actually, I think Dorne was against it. I can't remember 100%. We'll talk about it when we talk about Dorne and Guillemin, now, won't we? Now, eventually, all the legions agreed, but each Primarch kind of adhered to the tenets of the Codex Astartes in their own way. The Space Wolves were only divided once into the Wolf Brothers chapter, and the rest of the legion remained intact. And Guillemin may or may not have fully agreed to this. Hint, he threw a temper tantrum, but Russ wasn't going to budge. And a lot of this can be attributed to, some people believe the Connie's Helix can only apply to people on Fenris. Anyone from a different, um, I think it's called a throne world, or a world that basically feeds into uh, space marines. It won't, the, the Connie's Helix will rebel against them and the GNC will actually kill the, uh, the neophytes. So... It's really, it's really hindered the Space Wolves' growth from this point on. And this meant that post-Second Founding, the Space Wolves would be the largest chapter in the Imperium, retaining all 12 of their great companies. The 13th Great Company, that's where this, this, was, that's where this gets it, comes in, was tasked by, the, by Lehman Russ himself to go find Abaddon and kill him. Bring his head back to, to present to the Emperor on his golden throne. Now that is... There's another theory that they actually went about it on their own to go do this, but they they followed the Black what soon to become the Black Legion deep into the Eye of Terror, and they didn't surface for another ten thousand years. And of course, guys, you do have to know that every, everything in the Eye of Terror uh, works at a much different rate of time. So ten thousand years might have only been four hundred for them, might have only been a hundred for them, might have only been two years for them. In the Thirteenth Great Legion, or Great Company, I'm sorry doesn't surface all the way into the beginning of the 13th Black Crusade from Abaddon themselves. And that's when they find a, kind of eventually re-establish uh, contact. And, but I think that their, their history really requires a, a video in and of itself, especially their organization. Everything kind of, kind of changes for them because they're not allowed to replenish their ranks or anything. So if you guys are interested in knowing more about the 13th Legion, let me know. And I'll definitely do a, a video on them alone. I think it's really cool. But the argument was made that the... Uh, Space Wolves forces were really severely diminished by the time the Horus Heresy ended. And if you think about it, that's that's true, right? The Wheel of Fire campaign claimed, what, some 35,000 marine lives? It, uh, that's about a third of 100,000. And that happened near the beginning of the Crusade. In addition, the Wolves confronted two other legions and put them to the sword by whatever means. So that had to be another couple of hundreds of thousands. By the, by the time the Horus Heresy kicked off, they were probably at around 80 or 90% strength, you know, purely conjecture here. I'm just assuming that they would have wanted to replenish that. But during the events of Wolfsbane, Russ remarks that the Legion is down to around 400, four, I'm sorry, 40,000 strong. This is post Prospero burning and the Alexis Nebula. So there's no saying exactly how many, but I'd suffice to say anywhere as low as 10,000 on the bottom end or as high as 30,000 on the, on the top end are left by the time of the second founding. And I'll be honest with you, I think it's probably more on the 10,000 side. Wolf's Bane is a really interesting book and it talks about how um, 
essentially the wolves in all their anger throw themselves onto the swords of the uh, Sons of Horus. So it's definitely a very crippling book if you're a Space Wolf fan. So take that as you will. So all that taken into consideration, the Space Wolves are not known for their willingness to adhere to anyone's rules but their own. And Russ kind of followed almost no rule set out by the Codex. Instead, he kind of instilled the uh, same teachings that had been a part of the Legion for years. And as things kind of progress here, only a, a mere two millennia, or I'm sorry, 2,000 years after um, the actual horse, events of the Horus Heresy, we lose Lehman Russ. Lehman Russ disappears deep into the Eye of Terror. He kind of, he's this big grand feast, this, this massive... Um, We lose Lehman Russ. He's at this big, grand, massive feast, and he just disappears into the Eye of Terror. Essentially, he's standing there at the at the front of this feast, about to give some sort of massive toast, and his eyes just kind of glaze over, and it's like, as if he's stuck st stuck in a vision. And it pulls him away from the feast. He kind of tells his other wolf guard, like, "Hey, you're coming with me, Bjorn, the one-handed. You stay here. Who is the youngest of his wolf guard?" And he heads out on his ship, and and he's not heard from ever again. And he's kind of he leaves this, not a memento, but a, a kind of a word of saying, like, I, I'm going to come back, don't worry, I'll be there for the final battle of the wolf time, implying that kind of wolf time is the end times for uh, Warhammer 40,000. But it spawns something, it spawns the Great Hunt. Uh, for seven years, they wait for their liege lord to return, and when he doesn't, Bjorn, the one-handed, is becomes the new wolf lord of the Space Wolves. And in doing so, he issues the first of the Great Hunts. And the Great Hunts are basically these massive... Well, a hunt is a good word for it, but it's a massive kind of search party that's pioneered by the rest of the Space Wolves. Most of the other chapters have what they call a crusade. The Black Templars are always on crusade. Um, the Dark Angels will launch a crusade, or typically called a strike. Now, the Space Wolves have the great hunt and it's typically charged at bringing things back into imperial light but it's initially started by one of the rune priests or wolf priests seeing a vision from Lehman Russ themselves guiding them to some sort of location the first one they were able to reclaim the armor of Russ out of the temple of Horus and each one of these has done some sort of a, a massive victory, either for the Imperium or for the Space Wolves itself. They knocked out a massive Gene Stiller cult at Gehenna, and each one of these has done something to, to further uh, something or another. Now, they have not, of course, found Lehman Russ, and there have been a lot of conjecture as to where he is. Uh, some say that he's actually leading the 13th Great, great Company from deep in the Eye of Terror, and he's met, he met up with them. So there's a lot of conjecture, and that unfortunately kind of ties a bow on the story of Lehman Russ. He, easily one of my favorite Primarchs because he was the very first Primarch that I ever learned about. Uh, the Space Wolves hold a very special place in my heart because they're the first 40,000 army I ever played. Um, I played Bretonians and then I loved Bretonians so much that I wanted to play knights and knights and with shields and shit in space and I found the Space Wolves and they have fucking, I love wolves. I was a kid, I had a triple wolf moon shirt. I still have that fucking shirt somewhere and I just... Space Wolves will always be, of course, they're like the gnarliest of bro chad, like, hey, let's just do a forearm handshake and like butt heads now, but they'll always have a very special place in my heart because they were a very different chapter that they were back in 6th edition that they are now. In 8th edition, there's a lot of grand sweeping wording that kind of surrounds them and they've, they've taken a lot more of like the native, I guess not native, but like actual Germanic wording for a lot of their stuff, like the, uh, the what's it called, the... Fenra, uh, what I call her, the Wulka Fenrika is a, is a recent thing. They weren't called that back in the 6th edition. And if you call Space Wolf a Space Wolf to their face in the Warhammer 40,000 world, they get pissed off at you. They're, they are the Wulka Fenrika. They're not Space Wolves. So the lore for the Space Wolves and for Lehman Russ himself has, has definitely evolved over the years. And it's not over yet. We, we know that the Horse Heresy series has not ended. And we know that possibly... With the rise of the Primarchs, that we will get the return of Lehman Russ in 8th edition Warhammer 40,000, or maybe even 9th edition. Uh, a rumor mill that was actually started not too long ago, I think in um, July of 2018, was that he would be coming back to the game as a, almost like an Odin-like character, with missing an eye and having a raven that's supposed to represent the Emperor. Um, but we don't know yet. And we know that the, uh, the Russ himself has left a, a lasting legacy throughout the Space Wolves. 
And I talked about how the Space Wolves will always do what is perceived as right by the initial code set out by the Emperor, moreover than what is kind of the Imperium now. And there are a lot of in, there are a lot of instances of the there are multiple battles of the Fang, in which case the Space Wolves get into altercations. Well, the first battle of Fang is with uh, the Thousand Suns, but there's one with the Inquis Inquisition at the behest of three other chapters of Space Marines who come to the Fang itself and pretty much lay siege and, and do an, um, an orbital blockade of it. And it wasn't for Bjorn Fellhand, who is now uh, Bjorn One-Handed and turned inside of a, a, a Dreadnought after the first Great Hunt, um, the Space Wolves would have seen a lot more uh, uh, sanctions from the Inquisition. But you see that the Space Wolves are always trying to do what is right for the true Imperium. And we see that very commonly throughout a lot of the older legions. In the newer chapters, they have a lot more different value systems and stuff like that. But the Space Wolves will always be traditional, will always be ritualistic, and will always be kind of tied around that things that made them who they were as, as instilled by Lehman Russ. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video here today. You got a little bit more knowledge on our Primarch of Lehman Russ. I'm sorry it took me so long to get this out, but I figured with Christmas, Lehman Russ is the most Christmas-like of all the Primarchs. You put a beard in that motherfucker, he looks just like, he just looks like Santa. He looks just like Santa with like big ass things and like wolves and shit. But again, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video here today. Let me know which, video, which uh, Primarch you'd like me to do next. I'm open to anything. I think one of the big ones everyone wants to hear about is Conrad Kurz, and I'm more than happy to talk about him. But uh, do let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe. Um, I will be doing a lot more 40k videos here. Um, I hope to do that one on the 13th Great Company if you guys are interested in it. I've got another cool one in mind for the War Master, so do let me know if you want to see more 40k in the comments below. More than happy to provide that for you guys. But how, as always, have a good one and take care.